Hello everyone! Previously we covered evidence that the Sun has a real surface and explained why the standard solar model cannot properly account for the solar spectrum. It's time to abandon the gaseous model of the Sun. Some ideas from the 1800s stand the test of time. This one does not. Today I present a solar model based on the condensed matter and account for the true solar surface while focusing on the solar spectrum. Scientists have long recognized that the solar spectrum has a black body appearance. The standard solar model jumps to invoke opacity mechanism dependent on the free electrons and ions, including negative hydrogen ion, to produce the solar spectrum, as we saw in this video. But the classic building block of black bodies are graphite and soot. As a result, scientists are forbidden to account for the solar spectrum using processes which can never be associated with graphite when it generates a black body spectrum on Earth. Recall the words of Isaac Newton, therefore to the same effect we must as far as possible assign the same cause. So let's imagine graphite. It has an arrangement of carbon atoms called a lattice. It is also known as crystal structure. In this case, the structure is hexagonal planar. Planes of hexagons made of carbon atoms are stacked one on top of another in an AB-AB-AB pattern. Many interesting lattices exist in natural materials. A single layer of graphite is known as graphene. Recently, the scientific community has synthesized and observed all kinds of physical phenomena in graphene. A single layer has been found to absorb about 2% of the incoming light in the optical range. As a result, it would not take very many layers of graphene to reach an absorbance of 100%. Kirchhoff in the mid-1800s stated the following when addressing black bodies. This investigation will be much simplified if we imagine the enclosure to be composed wholly or in great part of bodies which, for infinitely small thicknesses, completely absorb all rays which fall upon them. Of course, the graphite he used at the time resembles many layers of graphene, which is why their properties are so similar. Graphene is made of carbon. A carbon atom has six electrons about its nucleus. Electrons are found in quantum shells, which give the probability of finding an electron at some location. The first four electrons are found in the 1s and 2s orbitals, in the first and second quantum shells respectively. The 2p orbitals contain the last two electrons in the second shell. Each p orbital can hold two electrons and is oriented along the x, y, or z axis. They are known as a 2px, 2py, and 2pz orbitals. When isolated, a carbon atom has two 2p orbitals with one electron in each and a third empty p orbital. What about carbon in graphene? The two electrons in the 1s shell stay where they are, but the four electrons in the second quantum shell get rearranged. The 2s orbital mixes with two of the 2p orbitals, and this is called sp2 hybridization. From the 2s and the two 2p orbitals, we get three new orbitals, each of which containing a single electron. The fourth electron is located in the remaining 2p orbital, which has not been hybridized. A bond is formed by pairing two lone electrons from the hybridized carbon molecular orbitals between two carbon atoms. In graphene, all the electrons in the sp2 hybridized orbitals pair with each other to produce the lattice. But the unpaired electron in the unhybridized p shell is what makes graphene interesting. Those unpaired electrons interact with other shells not used in hybridization and can be viewed as delocalized over the entire structure. This is important because these delocalized electrons are essential to absorbing the light. Graphene absorbs light of different frequencies. How? The entire graphene layer also vibrates. This vibration enables the delocalized p-shell electrons to absorb light at different frequencies. The wonderful aspect of all this is that the vibrations are absolutely linked to temperature. The greater the temperature, the greater the vibrations. This is why black body spectra are related to temperature. At a fundamental level, they are telling us about the vibrational state of the nuclei which make up the emitting lattice. Now we see why materials such as graphite and soot can emit a black body spectrum. First, they have delocalized electrons, which can assist in the absorption and emission of light. And secondly, 
They also possess a certain lattice structure, which permits a wide range of energies for the photons which generate the blackbody spectrum via vibrations. This is the central reason why the photosphere of the Sun must be condensed matter. In order to produce the white light of the solar spectrum, we need delocalized electrons and we need a vibrational lattice. But wait! The Sun is mostly hydrogen, which is usually a gas at high temperatures. So how can the Sun have a lattice like graphite? The answer has actually existed since 1935. At that time, Wigner and Huntington proposed that elevated pressures can be used to produce metallic hydrogen. How does this happen? Normally, hydrogen electrons occupy the valence shell and can bond with other atoms. Far above the valence shell, in terms of energy, exists a conduction band. The gap in energy between the valence shell and the conduction band is known as the band gap. Usually, the electrons from the hydrogen atom cannot enter the conduction band. Nearly 15 electron volts and a temperature of 175,000 Kelvin would be required for the electrons to enter the conduction band. That is a lot of energy, and that is why hydrogen acts as an insulator. But under high pressures, the conduction band energy is believed to fall from nearly 15 electron volts to about zero in hydrogen. The lone electron of each hydrogen atom can then easily enter the conduction band, producing metallic hydrogen with delocalized electrons. The vibrational energy of the lattice, increased at high temperatures, can also assist in promoting electrons into the conduction band. This downward movement of the conduction band accounts for the fact that compressed hydrogen can become a semi-metal like graphite and fully metallic under additional pressure. Relative to the Sun, it is important to highlight that Wigner and Huntington additionally thought that the most likely lattice for metallic hydrogen would be the hexagonal planar lattice, just like the one in graphite. So now the Sun can have the same lattice as graphite held together by delocalized electrons in conduction bands. The only difference is that we do not have true bonds like the sp2 hybridized molecular orbitals in graphite. So what keeps the structure of metallic hydrogen together? The answer is simple. The only requirement is that the hydrogen nuclei must be close enough to each other to allow for the proper quantum conditions to enable the formation of the conduction bands. It is the presence of the conduction bands, or the ability to at least partially delocalize the electrons, which lock the hydrogen nuclei into a lattice, requiring nothing further. This is not just theory either. Scientists have recently made the graphene form of dense hydrogen here on Earth. This confirms that hydrogen can adopt the needed lattice structure through conduction bands without any typical bond. The spectral signature of the strongly interacting hydrogen molecules is consistent with the presence of graphene-like sheets, a configuration predicted in early calculations on dense hydrogen. So why focus on the hexagonal planar lattice of carbon when the metallic hydrogen could assume other forms? For instance, Wigner and Huntington initially proposed that a body-centered cubic lattice could be used to describe metallic hydrogen. So why adopt a hexagonal planar structure for the metallic hydrogen lattice of the photosphere? There are a few reasons. The hexagonal planar structure is found in graphite and soot, naturally occurring black bodies on Earth. This form of metallic hydrogen could also function both as a semi-metal, like in graphite, and as a fully conductive metal when further compressed. In addition, Neil Ashcroft, a premier theoretical physicist and an expert in condensed matter, has insisted that metallic hydrogen in hexagonal structure can possess the optical properties of graphite itself. If so, it easily explains the optical characteristics of the photosphere and with further compression, the properties of sunspots and faculi as well. In addition, Wigner and Huntington predicted that the hexagonal planar structure of metallic hydrogen would be energetically easiest to synthesize, and it now appears that this has been the case in the laboratory. Ashcroft reminds us as well that this structure would have the proper optical characteristics. Finally, the Sun appears to give evidence for a layered structure at the macroscopic level, such as in coronal mass ejections and in the changing velocity of seismic wave after solar flares, as we saw in this video. 
Now you understand why the solar spectrum is so important. It is telling us something fundamental at the level of the atom and of the lattice. The sun is condensed matter with a true lattice. When we recognize this fact, it changes absolutely everything we know about astronomy. Future videos will discuss the convective zones, solar activity, and solar winds, and the elegant solutions provided by metallic hydrogen in stars using the guiding principles found in graphite. Our next video will apply the hexagonal planar structure of metallic hydrogen to the sun in order to account for the presence of limb darkening, intergranular lanes, faculi, and sunspots. In closing, I hope that you enjoyed this video on the solar spectrum and metallic hydrogen. If you did, hit that like button. In addition, subscribe to join me as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.